Bibles, and I want you to turn to two places, just one at a time. First, I want you to find Hebrews chapter 2, the first at the end of your New Testament. If over a while, I like should come back. And when we get there, we'll start about verse 10, so that'll give you, but stick a bullet in there, okay? Put a marker at Hebrews chapter 2, we'll start in verse 10 when we get there. And then when you mark that, turn back to our passage in Romans chapter 8, we'll start in verse 28. Now, if you're looking forward to a Father's Day sermon, tough. <laughs> I've delivered a number of those over the years. Um, kind of like I knew all about this. This is how you do it, guys. I'm less impressed with myself. As I think of what what influenced me. Well, for one thing. They had the brothers to church. Never discount the power of that. And a dad who grew in the Lord. Now, I, I think the earlier years of my mom and dad's marriage, mom kind of was the spiritual leader in some ways. But as we boys trusted Christ as their Savior, began to get into the Word and active in church and grew in the Lord, our dad grew too. And that had a tremendous influence on us. And all, especially you older guys, know and raising a family, kids, grandkids, there's a war on it. But God is still God. And he cares for our kids and our grandkids more than we do. was just one of the of God used him as, as an instrumental way in Warren Wiersbe's grandson coming back to walk with God. God answers prayer. And we need to be patient, persevering for our kids. chapter 8, as we continue our study, verse 28, we've been looking at where I, I kind of hope to get through this more quickly, but I'm just not a believer in just mentioning something once and breezing through it. God's people are meant to think, think through these things. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who were called according to his purpose. For those who before knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. In verses 28 through 30, we get to see things from God's point of view. Now, last week, we look at the fact that we can be sure that everything is being worked together for our eternal good because, as Paul says, we love God. 
And we look at the fact that all humankind can be divided into two groups, only two. Every man and woman on the face of the earth fits in one of these two groups. The God haters and the God lovers. I know that sounds extreme, but that's what the Bible teaches. Those who, were six, set their mind on the flesh, which is death, and those who set their mind on the spirit, which is life and peace. Psalm 1 talks about these same two groups, calls them the righteous and the wicked. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Those who love God, because they have a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ, desire to please Him, to live to His glory, to keep His commandments, to be like Him. And while none of us can say that we do these well enough, Every one of the God lovers can say, that's what I want. For the God lovers, as, as hard as things may be, and we live in an age of suffering, the glory is as inevitable as the suffering. All things work together for good to bring us to glory. On the other hand, for the person who deliberately continues without practice, we can say clearly that everything is against that person. Everything. God's character. God's law. God's holiness. God's judgment is against that person. The promise of verse 28 is for those who love God. But I want to look at another description for those for whom it is true that all things work together for good. We are, Paul says here, those who are called according to his purpose. And this description gives us an even more rock-solid reason for confidence that I am destined for glory, a destiny that cannot be changed. This description has nothing to do with what we do. It has everything to do with the unchanging God and what he does to accomplish his eternal unchanging purpose. Paul doesn't just say we love God. He can't live it there. Because the only explanation of why we love God is that he has called us. When we studied the beginning of this chapter, we, we saw that there's an absolute difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind of the flesh is death, but to set the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it is not subject to God's law, and neither cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. The mind of the non-Christian is not so meant to God. And Paul says it cannot. It is incapable of doing that. The only reason the Christian sets his mind on the Spirit is because God called him according to his purpose. These are the people that Paul wrote the letter to. Chapter 1, verse 7. I'm going to read it from the New American Standard Bible. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Literally, we call saints, saints who are called. Dr. Weiss, in his expanded translation, renders it divinely summoned saints. Now, somebody says, well, doesn't call, call everybody to be Christians? Well, in the sense of a general call to the whole world, yes. Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all creation. Paul told the Athenians, God commands all people everywhere to repent. But as Jesus said in Matthew 22, 14, many are called, but few are chosen. Not many are divinely summoned saints. Paul says to Timothy, in his second letter, God called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, 
Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which he has called you. Jude says this as he opens his short letter. Jude, the bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, kept for Jesus Christ. This letter is for those who are the called, those who are divinely summoned. Christians are Christians because they have been divinely summoned, called according to God's eternal purpose. That's why all things work together for good for them. Paul expresses it this way to the Corinthians. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace is what God does. It's never what man does. Paul was rather amazed to find himself called by God. There, there was no reason for him to be called. And every reason for him not to be. To be called means your life has been interrupted, disturbed. God has done something to you. You do not call yourself. God calls you. You are divinely summoned. To be called means that you know that God has been concerned about you, that he's done everything for you, and he's interfered in your life, and come bursting into your life and lay hold of you. It's not a case of taking up religion. It's not a case of becoming interested in religion. I remember watching an interview with Catherine Hepburn, the great actress. And at one point in the interview, the interviewer said, well, what about religion? And she had this really confused look on her face and said, why? I was never interested in that sort of thing. But Paul, he's talking about this. This has nothing to do with people's interests. The people Paul is talking about feel that God has come to them and taken hold of them. Like Paul says in Philippians 3.12, Christ Jesus laid hold of me. He apprehended me, kind of like a police officer coming up and laying a strong hand on your shoulder and saying, might as well come along quietly. God interferes in our life. And you find yourself convicted of sin. You know that you're guilty before God. It's not your idea. So that's not what you want. You want to be left alone. But God will not leave you alone. You're not doing this to yourself as the last thing you want, but you know that God is speaking. You know that what you're hearing is the word of God. It's God's word disturbing you. The natural person does not believe the Bible is true to him. The Bible is just a book like any other book. But when a person is called by God, he knows that the Bible is not just the ideas of people, it's the word of God. In writing his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul says, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Notice he didn't thank them for listening. He thanked God that they listened. This is the word of God. You find yourself convicted of sin and you come to understand the complete sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, who went to the cross of Calvary to save all who put their faith in him. As we studied earlier in chapter 3, who are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a propitiation. Remember, we studied that word. It means a legal satisfaction. Christ satisfied the law of God on the cross whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So can say, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who 
who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the purpose of God. The implemented plan of God. God did this. That's why it's sure. That's why we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who were called according to his purpose. And then in verses 29 and 30, I was really hoping to get through both verses, but it's too much, so we'll just look at 29 today. He defines that purpose. Here's the purpose for God. God's purpose for his people. Verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now we're going to talk about foreknowledge next week. We're going to talk about predestination. Other words, great theological words in verse 30. But this is the purpose. To be conformed to the image of his son. And notice that the purpose he states here is not that our sins would be forgiven. Now, in Christ they are forgiven. Praise God. In him, Ephesians 1 and 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished. God's purpose is so much more than just being forgiven. So much more than just being able to go to heaven one day. Forgiveness is just the first step in this grand purpose that was originated in the mind and the will of God. Salvation is far more than just justification. In fact, justification is far more than forgiveness. Now, you remember as we study justification in chapter 3, justification is a declaration that we are righteous in the sight of God, that he sees us as being righteous even though we are not righteous. You do realize that, don't you? That you're not righteous. If you're not sure about that, ask your wife. I hate to ruin your father's day, but... It's a declaration. That we are righteous, even though we are not righteous, because he credits us with the righteousness of Christ. But salvation does not stop even at that. Not only is the righteousness of Christ credited to us, it guarantees that something further is going to be done to us. Something that guarantees the certainty of all of salvation's blessings. The final blessing for everyone who is a Christian is that we are to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn of many brothers. Now that is a jaw-dropping statement. Think of that. My dad always used to say, think of that. We will be conformed to the image of his Son. This is the height of all Bible teaching on salvation. Now, I'm not putting down forgiveness, or guidance, or comfort, and all, all the other blessings of the Christian life. But if you really want to be more than a conqueror, which is what this chapter is about, to be able to say that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed, then you've got to get a hold of this. We're, you know, we're, we're so much into attacking the need of I feel at the moment. And we start and we end with what problem am I dealing with? What uh, sin am I struggling with? What healing do I need or think I need? And we concentrate so much on blessings like that, we lose sight of the glory that is the ultimate goal to be conformed to the image of the Son. This is what God is preparing for us right now. 2 Corinthians 3 18. Even now, we all, with unveiled face, 
Behold it as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. We all, we, we Christians, and, and if you read 2 Corinthians 3, it won't take time now, but unlike the Jews who read the scriptures every Sabbath in their synagogues with a veil over their heart so that they could not understand and believe what they read, in joining us to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has taken off the veil so that in the scriptures we see Christ. That changes us. Now that's just the start of it. Here in verse 29, we're, we're looking at the completion of it. The ultimate goal is the image of the Son. Satan's goal is for people not to see that image. Again, from 2 Corinthians 4, in whose case, the unbelievers, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the image of God. Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Image means more than a likeness. It is not an accidental likeness. It's a likeness that comes directly from the original. We sometimes say that a child, let's say a, a, a boy, he's the image of his father, or maybe we we'll say she's the image of her mother. Now, there may be some other unrelated person who may resemble the parent in certain ways, even to the point you may be mistaken for them. That happens in court sometimes. Yeah, I saw him. He was there. Just you, know, you look at the real young person who the first one was accused. How did you mistake those? You know. <laughs> but the child is directly derived from the parent, and we, who are children of God in Christ Jesus, are to be. We will be like the Son of God in that sense. We are to be conformed to that image, be brought into the same form with that image. It's not a mere superficial likeness. It's not just something on the surface. It is the outward expression of the inward nature. We will bear his stamp on us, his likeness in our very nature, our very nature changed by and derived from his. And Paul says something else that adds to our understanding of this. This grand plan and purpose of God is in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Many brothers. All slew of them. All with the same derived essence. We saw in chapter 5 that we were once in Adam. We were children of Adam. Just like people say he's the image of his father, that was our image. The image of all mankind. By our very nature, we are all brothers as children of Adam. Now people try to dignify that. Oh, isn't that great that all people are brothers? Well, yeah, that's why they steal, lie, kill, and plot against each other, use each other. They say, oh, those things are very inhuman. Oh, oh, no, they're not. They're very human. That is our nature. That is our image. As we are born, we bear the image of Adam. But Jesus Christ came to create a whole new people. Not to reform society and make it better, but to make a new people. To call out from the world a people for his name of people to be given a whole new image. Okay, now I had to put a marker in Hebrews chapter 2. Now we're going to kind of flip back and forth. I'll try not to do that too much, okay? So keep uh, keep your keep one hand in Romans 8 and flip over to Hebrews 2, beginning with verse 10. Hebrews 2, verse 10. Christ came to create a whole new 
to make the Father of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. Literally rendered, they are all of one. The American Standard says they are all from one Father. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Then he quotes from the Old Testament three different quotes, saying, quote, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, another quote, I will put my trust in him. And again, another quote, Behold, I am the children God has given me. In Jesus Christ, we, along with many other sons, now, remember as we looked at the word son, the Greek word sons, doesn't mean males, it means adult legal heirs. We are brought to glory. That's the outcome of being conformed to the image of God's Son. Now, keep your finger there in Hebrews 2, put it back to Romans 8. We are and will be, in the verse 3, glorified. To say that I am to be conformed to the image of his son. To say that I am to become a kind of brother of the son is another way of saying that I am to be glorified. Jesus Christ went to the cross to bring many sons to glory. We saw in chapter 5, verse 2, that we rejoice with triumphant jubilation in hope of the glory of God. Chapter 8, verse 23, not only the creation, which waits with eager longing for the revealing of the Son of God, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Our very bodies will be glorified, delivered from everything that sin has ever done to us. As Paul said in Philippians 3, Christ, when he comes, will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. To be glorified means we shall be like him, like him in spirit, like him in body. He is already glorified. Don't flip the Hebrews 9 too, but let me read verse 9. But we see him, as Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. We will be like him. We saw here in chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Let me just read it for you. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back to the fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And of children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. In verses 28 through 30, they explain those verses. It is only as we are glorified and conformed to the image of his Son that all of this becomes true of us completely and fully. Now, let's be clear about something. When we're talking about being like Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ was absolutely unique. There is no other Son of God in the full sense that He is, and there never will be, as the only Son or the only begotten Son of God. He's co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. He is God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity. Right in the Hebrews starts his letter, He is the radiance of of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. 
John opens his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when Paul says we are to be conformed to the image of the Son, he does not mean we are to become gods. That's what Mormons teach. They don't let that out, but they get you into their Bible studies and get you involved with them, and they'll eventually reveal that that's what they teach. Become a Mormon, live a perfect life, you also become a god. That is not what Paul is teaching. Being God is uniquely true of Jesus Christ. But he who was with God and was God became the second Adam for our salvation. Okay, now back to Hebrews 2, look at verse 14. Since therefore the children shared in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. This is what theologians call the incarnation. The eternal Son of God, who was in the form of God and one with the Father, added to himself human nature. And in the mystery of the incarnation, in the womb of the Virgin, God became man. And he was born as Jesus. Truly man as well as truly God. Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. He goes on, The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. He came into the world to begin a new humanity, and he is the firstborn among many brothers, the beginner of a new race. A race started in Adam, another race started in Christ. And the image that you and I will be conformed to, that the Holy Spirit through the Word is working on right now, conforming us to, is the image of the last Adam, this perfect, full humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is joined to his eternal sonship, joined to his being God. It's an amazing, amazing thing. When we are born again, we receive the seed of this new nature, a, a part of this new humanity in Christ. We're born of him. He is the head. We're the members. The Holy Spirit does this. We are partakers of the divine nature. Christ is the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man, the beginner of this new race. He has taken this glorified humanity back with him to heaven. And we are linked with him. And that link can never be dissolved. We are his body. Ephesians 5.30. When God's work is complete, we will be conformed to his image. Again, in Hebrews 2, verse 5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. But it has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little Lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of 
God, you might taste that for everyone. Crown with glory and honor because he is there, we will arrive there. And when we are there, we will be lords of creation. We will reign with him, sharing this state of glory with him forever and ever. That is the purpose of God. John Calvin said, The Son of God became the Son of Man, that the sinful sons of men might become the sons of God. Keep that in front of you. He came down as low as anyone could go to lift you to this height. The other John says in his first letter, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Conformed to the image of his son. That is God's purpose. His purpose for you. That is why all 